David Attenborough is the man who made his name on the trail of rare animals in the more remote and inaccessible jungles and deserts of the world. Uh, he himself is something of a rare specimen in his own habitat, the world of television. He's uh, a performer with his own distinctive style, he's been a producer of programmes of many different kinds, and he's held high office in the management of the BBC. And even more extraordinary, he's been outstandingly successful in each of those fields. David Attenborough grew up in Leicester. His father was principal of what is now the city's university. David went to Wigston Grammar School there, and so incidentally did his brother Richard, who became equally successful and well-known as an actor and film director. And then it was to Cambridge for David to read zoology, national service in the Royal Navy, and soon afterwards into the BBC as a trainee television producer. Let's take it from there, David. Did you, from the start, go producing your natural history programmes? Uh, no. Uh, 1952, television was uh, uh, quite small. Um, it had started, of course, before the war, but it was only just getting into its stride after the war. Uh, and the number of people on the staff uh, was very small. So that uh, if you joined, uh, you were prepared to, you had to be prepared to do all sorts of things. So I did programs on not only natural history, but archaeology and quizzes and uh, political discussions, party political broadcasts, uh, epilogues, religious programs, ballet programs even. And sometimes as many as three a week, live, of course, which was very good, very good training. That perhaps is uh, the outstanding difference, I suppose, between television as it was then and most of television today. Um, yes, and of course it's it's both good and bad. Uh, as a as a director, as a producer, um, you used to get terrifically wound up if you produced a program, uh, and it went out say at ten o'clock at night, and the whole day had been coming up to this particular climax, uh, and the the uh, half hour or three quarters hour, whatever it was, of live transmission led you as a director to get very histrionic, waving your arms around the control gallery and so on. And when you got home, a great deal of unwinding was necessary. Were you but producing any programmes that would be still remembered today? Oh, um, well, I don't know whether people remember them. Um, some, I'm sure, mercifully, are totally forgotten because many were terrible, of course, I mean, which is one of the penalties of being li of live television. I mean, being recorded has improved the quality of programmes in a technical sense a lot. I, I started as a production assistant on a programme called Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, which I didn't uh, invent. It was made by, by Paul Johnston, and I was his assistant on the second programme and then was with it for several years after that. This is very well remembered, of course, and I saw a clip of it only the other day. Um, it did seem to me terribly dated, although most people remember it with affection and nostalgia and admiration. Oh, yes, a huge dated. Uh, and, uh, of course, that's what you think about films, too. I, I saw one of the first films I ever saw, I think probably the first film I ever saw, which may say something what happened later, was Sanders of the River which I thought was a magnificent, hard-hitting, convincing epic of life in Central Africa. I saw it on television again about two years ago, and of course it was, it was simply unspeakable. Um, and Animal, Vegetable, Mineral was of its time, particularly in terms of pace. Um, we are now, as an audience, extremely sophisticated about our television programmes, and we accept all sorts of shorthands and conventions, jump cuts in technical terms and so on. Um, but in those days you didn't, and in those days it was extremely leisurely. And I know that particular recording you, you speak of because that's the only one that exists of that entire series. And it's extremely leisurely. The chairman, Glyn Daniel, says, and now for those of you who don't wish to see what this object is, close your eyes and up comes the captain. And it was very slow. But to be fair, it was great at the time. Oh, it was great because, uh, if it was great, because of the quality of the people who appeared in it. And they don't date. I mean, I saw Sir Mortimer Wheeler on television only a, a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, he's older, of course he's older, he's older by 20 years or so, uh, but he is just as great as he ever was. Now what about you? How did you bridge that gulf between being a producer and becoming a performer? Well, I didn't have any alternative. I, I put up an idea in uh, 1954 that we should uh, Im elaborate on what was happening at the time. The, the man in the early 50s for animals was very great naturalist called George Cansdale 
and George Cansdale was at the London Zoo, and he used to bring in animals from the zoo, and he would show them on a table, a sort of doormat thing, which was absolutely the right way to do it, and the animals always bit him or <laughs> escaped or something, and caused great headlines in newspapers. But of course, the trouble with that was that you, the animal looked sort of as though it was extraordinary. You didn't understand why it had legs that shape or tail that shape, and you could only understand that if you saw it in the wild. Uh, now, Armand Michaela Dennis was starting at that time too, and they showed what it was in the wild. But on the other hand, nobody thought that, w that the elephants were going to charge them or bite them or do the other things that they would do to George Cansdale. So I thought, if you could put the two things together, uh, you might have quite a good recipe for a program. So let's do one where you film the animal in the wild, it's then caught, and then you have it in the studio live. And that was the basis of, of Zoo Quest. And we, we did that. Um, the, was, uh, Jack Lester was a curator of reptiles at the zoo, London Zoo, in those days. And, and Jack and I did a joint expedition. He was going to do the presentation, and I was going to do the filming. Uh, but very uh, tragically, as it subsequently proved, he became ill after the first program. And as I say, everything was live. So uh, Jack couldn't appear, and I had to appear in his place. But that was a decision by what they call management, wasn't by <laughs> Did you see yourself thereafter as a performer or a, a producer, first and foremost? Well, I don't think that sort of distinction uh, occurs to you in television. Uh, uh, in that instance, I thought I was the author of the programme. I mean, it was my... I, I had written it or directed it, and uh, if I could have got... If it would have been better to get an actor to speak lines which I'd written, I'd have got an actor. Um, it just happened to be more expensive to get an actor or not, not as convincing or something. I mean, that was why. But animal zoology has been a great enthusiasm. I mean, that's what you read at, uh, at Cambridge. Yes. Uh, does it go back earlier than that to your days in the Midlands? Oh, well, natural history certainly does. Um, I, uh, natural hi the Midlands is a great place, of course, to grow up. Um, and uh, I don't know what it's like now, but, but certainly uh, in the 30s, um, I used to bicycle a great deal all over the Midlands. And from a geological point of view, of course, the Midlands is marvellous because, well, for one thing it is not, it's provincial. It's, it, the Midlands is enormously fam uh, famous throughout the world amongst geologists. Uh, there's a fossil, there's a little village, which I used to know very well, I, and I'm sure it's still there, whether, whether it's a village still, I don't know. Tilton. Tilton uh, is on the Arnstone country. Uh, and there's one particular kind of fossil called Tiltonosaurus, which was internationally known after that little village. The Charnwood Forest, one of the key sites where people really discovered some of the oldest rocks in the, on the surface of the earth. There's a village called Attenborough, as I recall. Somewhere. Ah, well, yes, there is indeed. Um, I, I, as a matter of fact, I didn't even, I wasn't born, I was born in, in Isleworth in, in, in um, London. But I, I once had to leave school uh, during the day on what was a bit of a jaunt, really. Uh, and I had a terrible guilty feeling that I was, as it were, playing hooky. And I had to go down to Middle Road Station in Leicester and get on the train and go to Nottingham. And I got on a little train, feeling enormously guilty. <laughs> and uh, the train stopped at every station, and it stopped at one station, and suddenly a porter stuck his head into the window and bawled, Attenborough, you see, and I leapt to my feet and said, yes, sir. And it was, a, it was of course, the village of Attenborough that we had stopped in. It was the first time I ever knew that there was such a village. And actually, my father uh, was born very close to Attenborough, and, and doubtless the family came from there. Quite a talented family environment, I should think. I don't know, but was your brother already, when you were boys together, showing signs of his interest in uh, the theatre? Oh, Lord, yes. I mean, he, uh, he was acting from as long as I can remember. I mean, on the stage, off the stage, he was always acting something or other. And if he wasn't doing that, he was organising other people, such as his brothers and so on, to act as well, supporting parts, naturally. <laughs> but, uh, no, he was all the time getting on uh, shows of one sort or another. And, um, and I, I, used to, I used to be dragooned by him to join him. Perhaps this is where you uh, picked up a few techniques as a performer. <laughs> In your ZooQuest zoo uh, programmes, you put yourself uh, into some fairly hair-raising, hazardous, even uh, repugnant uh, situations, it seemed to me. Um, were they really like that? Well, honestly, uh, I, I, I feel a bit guilty, really. The, I did a series um, some time back in Borneo, and in, in one of the films we were in a cave where there were a lot of bats and things, and a pile of bat dung and so on. 
and, and people said, must have been absolutely awful climbing that back down. Um, I think it seems awful if you sit on your nice sofa at home full of comfort and civilization and cleanliness and so on, but it doesn't seem in the least awful when you're there. It truly doesn't. And to be absolutely candid, I would far rather climb up that pile of bat dung every morning to go to work than get on the Piccadilly line in the rush hour, which I have to do. Uh, it seems to be much less repugnant. <laughs> I remember what one of the television critics said about that particular program because that was after you had returned to making programs after mm. being an executive, a high mm. executive yes. with the BBC and he said, uh, here is Attenborough who has been uh, rained upon by bats standing on a mountain of guano, um, knee-deep in crawling cockroaches. I hadn't realised that the jungle of the television centre was quite that bad. <laughs> the man would seek that form of escape. Yeah. Which really brings us on to this uh, extraordinary move you made from uh, being a performer and a producer of programmes to going into the management and administration. How did that happen? What happened in that particular instance was that Hugh Weldon, who was then um, in charge of all programming, number two in television service, but responsible for both networks, um, simply um, came round and asked me if I'd like to take over BBC Two from Mike Peacock, who was had been running it up to then, and it was then about he had been running it for about eleven months since it had gone on the air, and was going to BBC One. Um, and um, it's a very uh, flattering, exciting thing to be offered because uh, what, in effect, uh, Hugh Weldon was saying is, look, here's a network uh, for various reasons, very few of which had uh, anything to do with, with Mike Peacock. It wasn't his fault. But it, it had to have a revision of its program policy. And here are several million pounds per annum which you can spend on programs. So go ahead. Well, now, if you're interested in television at all, I mean, you can't say, take it away. A lot of people were tremendously surprised by this change, though. Oh, well, so was I. Hmm. But surprised that you should be chosen, surprised that you having been chosen, you should want to make the, the move. How did you find it? Did you find it uh, satisfying? Well, um, I actually think that, um, that, that a, a, a fairly, a moderately well-mannered chimpanzee would actually take over a number of, of senior posts in the BBC for about six months before being discovered. <laughs> because actually the backup is so good, you see. I mean, quite truthfully, the first six months that I was in, uh, in the BBC Two chair, um, I didn't know about finance and I didn't know about all sorts of aspects of things. But there were a lot of people who really did and who were um, bending over backwards to lay their expertise at your disposal, provided you were prepared to say what the general policy direction you wanted to go. And was this satisfying to you? Because it meant that you were telling the creative people what they'd got to do or inspiring them to go off and produce programmes. You, you had been a very successful programme producer yourself. Could you find this satisfying in a vicarious sense? Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, to start with, there were all these new expertise in these new fields and these new problems, which are very interesting to discover how they work and why they work and so on. Um, and secondly, it's very nice to be sort of uh, skipping around and say, chucking out an idea here and there and, uh, <laughs> and to go saying to chaps, um, why don't we do a program about... Um, well, why don't we do a program about archaeology? Why don't we have a monthly program about archaeology? There's never been a monthly program about archaeology. Well, that I think probably was just, but, but not on a, a totally continuing basis. Uh, anywhere else in the world? Let's do that. And you did. Well, we called it Chronicle, um, which was splendid and a very nice thing to do. Why don't we do a program for When Colour Comes, which was another in marvellous excitement, to be the first colour television uh, network in Europe uh, was enormously exciting. Um, and, and to be able to say, well, now what should we start off with? Why don't we find all the most beautiful things that Europe has to offer and show them in colour with uh, the best possible, most informed guide to take us around them, who puts them together so they make sense, and so you get civilization. Well, I mean, that's, 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 that's marvellous to be able to, to be involved in that sort of game. If you found it so satisfying then, why did you give it up? Um, well, uh, I did BBC Two for four years, and then through various changes, um, uh, the, the next job up became uh, vacant, and I was put in that. Uh, the next job up was uh, not as much fun as BBC Two, because quite truthfully, 
uh, running BBC Two is the best job in television administration in the world. I mean, there's no... N I could go on as to why it's so marvellous, but it, it is. Uh, and the, the other job I had was that much more removed from programmes. Uh, that, too, had its fascinations. I did that for four years. But if you think that those sort of jobs ought to be run by youngish people, um, then after you've been in them for a bit, it's time you moved over. And in any case, uh, there are lots of other things to do. And I'd done, as I say, eight years in administration. That seemed to me enough. You were a bit frustrated. The creative bit of you was frustrated. Yeah, I mean, I... Um, yes, yes, I mean, it's... I just wanted to go and do something else. When you left, which is, uh, what, about uh, two years ago, a bit mm. less than two years, I think, um, one of the critics said that you were, at that time, in the running as a future director general of the BBC, and you had gracefully bowed out from the race or something to that effect. Did you see yourself in, in that way? Oh, I couldn't think that anybody would do that. No, of course not. How, how can you know? Um, I, I mean, the fact of, uh, factors of, of what makes a man become director general uh, are um, very curious and, and complicated and unpredictable. Um, and um, in any case, uh, th there I was, uh, 46 or whatever I was, was I wanting to go and spend another 14 years um, in that particular area of administration? Um, many people would, uh, I'm sure. Um, and. But I, I, I just didn't. I, <laughs> the thought of, of spending the la you know, un until yeah. I retired doing that sort of thing was, I wanted to, ch to change once more before then. Well, let's go back to your natural history programs, which you were doing and indeed are doing now. Um, what do you see as their function? I mean, do you do these because you are interested in animals, because you are a zoologist? Do you do them because you are a television person, and this is a, 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 the, the kind of television which appeals to you. Do you do them as an entertainment, as an education, or what? What's their purpose? Um, well, you can describe their purpose in lots of, um, uh, of ways. I mean, cynically, you could say it's a very good device of getting yourself to exciting places in the world. And Did I you say they're not exciting? Oh, yes, they're exciting. No, I said they're not uncomfortable. They're enormously exciting. Of course they're exciting. All right, tell me a bit about the excitement. We'll come back to the other thing in a minute. Well, um, uh, I'll, answer, I'll answer that. Um, I, I truly think that... Um, uh, well, I personally get huge pleasure from seeing certain things. Uh, from seeing, let us say, a, a lake covered with flamingos in the early dawn in Africa, uh, which is a marvellous, thrilling, exciting sight. Now, uh, when it happens, you get this enormous pleasure. Now, I actually get a, an additional pleasure from telling you about it, or from telling anybody about it. Um, and if I, can, if I can communicate that pleasure to others through various devices like television cameras or whatever else, that is an enormous reinforcement of the pleasure for me. And I'm not proselytizing. Um, Though I dare say, perhaps I am unconsciously so doing, but I'm not doing it because I'm wanting to go out and tell people they ought to do something. I'm just saying I think this is enormously pleasurable and inspiring, I, and therefore I thought you might like to see it. So you are taking enjoyment to people, but are you taking to them something that it is important for them to know, important for them perhaps to take some action about? Well, uh, to be to speak purely personally, I think there is a role for uh, for the program, which is the pioneering, uh, hard hitting, uh, campaigning program. Um, uh, sure, it's playing a proper role in society and all that. On the other hand, I personally can have enough of people leaning out of the television screen and saying, you lazy, irresponsible, ignorant chap sitting there in your comfortable suburban home, why don't you care for this or subscribe to that or go out and do the other? I mean, there is a place for that, but not for me. There I is a lot of that, that in, in uh, nature programmes on television. Well, I, I hope there's not too much. I, I mean, I think every now and again that it's worth reminding people that these splendid things have, have got to be looked after. But primarily, I think the programmes are so that people may share the delight in the things that have brought you delight. Are you worried uh, about conservation? Very much. But you don't feel that it's part of your job to uh, take this message to people? Oh, I do. 
uh, and perhaps I am being um, a little, um, what, I don't know. But, but I actually think the best way of taking the message to the people is by, is by showing them the pleasure. Not necessarily by saying, every time, you've got to do something about it, but by saying, look, isn't this lovely? And the other bit follows.